it, you guys! We hit a million subscribers, which I didn't even think would be possible, but here we are. So whether you're watching this video and you're a subscriber or not, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for all of your support to help us get to where we are today. Snake Discovery first started thanks to this snake right here. This is Janet, our bull snake. He was my very first snake, and he is just a sweetheart. He might just be a normal mutation with no heads even, but he is, he was the gateway snake to the world of reptiles, and he's the reason why we're obsessed with them today, or at least I am. Who was your Athena? Probably. She, okay, the ball python Ed had was his gateway snake. You know, everyone has a certain reptile that gets them hooked. We want to do something big to show our appreciation for all of your support, so we have not today's one video as a celebration, but we have five videos planned to celebrate this big milestone. The first three are going to be kind of a tour around our house and uh, just showing you all of our reptiles, and they will come out pretty much in a row. The last two celebratory videos might be a little bit longer of a wait, and I'll explain why once we get to them. It, to make it easier to find all of these one million celebration videos, we'll put a blue border around the thumbnail of each one, so it'll be really easy for you to identify them and click on it and see the next part of this celebration. We are also unveiling, I'm really excited for this, we are unveiling a brand new piece of merch that was designed by one of our fans. Lexi created this design and we even tweaked our logo to match the colors that she used and now it's part of our merch store, but it'll only be in the store for two weeks, so that's until March 8th you have to order this awesome t-shirt if you would like one. Today's video will be part one of our reptile house tour. So without further ado, let me show you some snakes. Since we just had Janet out, I figured we should start with some of his babies. He was also the very first snake we ever bred, so that's another reason why he's so special to us. Uh, one of his babies is down here. This is from the very first clutch we hatched a couple of years ago. It was Janet and Brad. This is Hannah, one of their babies. And as you can see, she's not like huge by any means. That's because we're not trying to like power feed these to be able to like beef them up faster. It cuts down their lifespan considerably, so we're feeding them at a normal rate. Not only did we keep this female from that clutch, we kept almost all of them. The reason why we kept so many bull snakes from this clutch, oh man, come back, is because of. This one right here. This is Stripey. He's gotten so big! We have one escaping. She's just going back there though, it's okay. Here, you can also go by the door. And yes, we can tell them apart. <laughs> That's why I'm okay with them all being together. So, most bull snakes... Sorry. We're never gonna get this shot done. <laughs> no! Most normal bull snakes have kind of a checkered belly to them. See the checkered belly right here? But Stripey has pretty much an all-white belly. And he's got these beautiful stripes down each side of that belly. He, these stripes, it's kind of a partial stripe. I mean, it's almost completely there, but it is broken. But the stripes continue all the way up to his head. So this is just a really pretty bull snake. And the dorsal pattern's also a little bit different. You can see the dorsal pattern of this normal sister of his. And then compare it to stripies. And there's a little bit of a difference there too. So we're really curious to see if Stripey's pattern here is unique or if it was just kind of a an abnormality that won't be replicated, but we won't know for sure until we raise them all up and breed them out. So yeah, we're just kind of hanging on to them right now for a future breeding project. Of course, you know, Stripey is this one right here and this is, let's see, is this the, this is Dottie. Dottie actually is not super friendly, so I'm surprised she's not trying to bite me right now. Back here, we have a light that's in the way. That's Hannah. She's apparently a new species of arboreal bull snake. Down here is Tina. She is in shed. She's a little more skittish, but she's calming down now that I'm starting to uh, introduce her into programs. And this is Jane. There is nothing really special with her pattern, so she's a plain Jane. That's how we got her name. But uh, we have a lot of bull snakes <laughs> just from that clutch. Now we are planning on breeding Stripey to his four sisters to see if his pattern is genetic, and if it is, to see if they also carry that weird stripe gene. 
Um, it might sound weird, but it is normal for snakes to interbreed occasionally, because in the wild they don't disperse as much as birds or mammals do, so they are able to handle a little bit of that line breeding without any ill effects. So it might sound weird, but it's completely normal in the snake world for siblings to occasionally breed, and that's why we're doing it, is to see if it's a genetic mutation that we may have discovered. Okay, this is too much. Too much snake. Let's put you back. Ugh. Okay, now that those bull snakes are all put away, let's actually start with this rack right here. In this bin is... Oh, you're a sassy one. We're going to start off with you, though. This is our scaleless Texas rat snake. Texas rat snakes are known for their attitudes, so he's going to be striking constantly. I think he's in shed. Oh, no, he's not. He just is chilling in his humidity box. Really cool-looking scaleless snake. We got him when we were first getting into scaleless because... He was, uh, we found him, like, it was a Craigslist deal, and we're like, yes, please, we'll take another one. I like their big, derpy eyes, like, they're kind of funny looking. And they feel exactly how you would expect them to. Like, they feel like skin. It's really, really unique. And that's the, uh, Texas rat snake attitude for you. He's, oh, you know what? I can actually, I couldn't see that before. He's got some pattern down his back. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. That's kind of new. That's really pretty. So he's grown up really nicely for us. We uh, have since gotten more scaleless, so I don't know if we'll end up using him in breeding, but we're just raising him up in the meantime. Just like most scaleless rat snakes, he does still have some scattered scales on his back, and his belly is still fully scaled, but really pretty yellow scales, I think. It's really neat. Underneath that rat snake is... Hang on, let's see if I can find her. Oh, I see her. This is a species that we're really excited to be working with and soon to be breeding even. This is a tricolor hognose snake. This is one of the more tropical species of hognoses. Uh, they don't like permanently wet substrate, but they do seem to like slightly higher humidity levels than like western hognoses do. She was really pretty as a baby, and they usually are, but it's a hit or miss on how pretty they'll be as adults. Our female has really darkened out with age, and as she's grown, she's the red bands have kind of turned into black bands, but our male here is remaining as bright as he was as a hatchling. We got them both at the same age at the same time, and this just is a good example of how much faster females typically grow, since they are the same age. And uh, I think she may be ready to breed this upcoming season. Um, yeah, I think she would be ready to breed. She's like a young adult, but she it, it still might work out. We might actually breed these this year. I'm hoping so anyway. We don't know for sure if we'll have babies from them, but fingers are crossed that we do. These two are eating appropriately sized frozen thawed rodents for us. They don't seem to be as picky of eaters as western hognoses are. The only downside is they are more expensive because they're harder to find and not many people breed them. But I'm going to just put these guys back and move on to the next ones. We actually have our male in this habitat over here. He seems to really like the eco-earth mixed with cypress bedding, and so it's, since it's a... He does seem to prefer kind of wet uh, substrate up front, and then it's drier in the back. You can kind of see that it's really dry substrate back here. Up front, we have springtails in here, and I want to add some isopods too, and those are just small invertebrates that will break down waste matter. And it keeps... Oh, here's a bunch of... They like the water dish for some reason? These are the springtails. See how they bounce off? They just spring off my fingers? That's why they're called springtails, and they just eat decaying matter. They're a great janitor cleanup crew. Next, we actually are going down a few levels. We have a lot of our snakes in brumation right now. That's why there's so many empty bins. So we'll just have to get you guys all caught up once those snakes come out of brumation. I was hoping to do this tour after everything was already awake, but you guys subscribed too quickly. I wasn't ready. So this is just what we have awake right now. Next would be our beautiful Mexican black king snake. This girl is growing so fast. She's shedding like every three weeks, it seems. It's ridiculous. She's a great eater. Mexican black king snakes are like all the rage right now. It seems like everybody wants one. And I can understand why. They're beautiful snakes. When they're not in shed, like she is, they're like iridescent too. You kind of see a rainbow of colors in their scales in the right light. But unfortunately, she's in shed, so you're not going to see that today. They also seem to be one of the more calm species of king snakes, which is one of the reasons why, along with them being good eaters, why we recommend these as one of our top five starter snakes. If you want to see the rest of the top five snakes we recommend for beginners, we actually have a video about it. It looks like this. I recommend checking that out later. 
I've received a lot of emails from people asking when we'll have babies. As you can see, our female is still pretty small, so we're at least a year or two out before she's big enough to breed. We do have a male lined up for her when she's ready. Vicky, if you're watching this, I'm still excited to use Carlos to uh, pair up with her when the time comes. But again, we will not be producing Mexican black king snakes this year, 2019, so I do apologize for that. But you're just too little. Let me actually show you her habitat here. This is a, what is it, 28 quart bin? Yeah. For size reference. Uh, 28 quart bin, and it's plenty room, plenty of room for her. We have a hide on the cool end, a hide on the warm end, and this is how I'd recommend setting one up at home too. You have your multiple hides, water dish, things to climb on and around. And since she's in blue, we have her humidity box on the warm end. And by using humidity boxes, it gets you like perfect sheds. Like ideally you want a snake's shed to come off in one piece, including the eye caps. You see those little scales where the eyes are right there? If those come off with the rest of the shed all in one piece, you're doing something right. This is exactly what you're looking for. Here are all of our fat-tailed geckos. No, they are not all housed together. We do have the male housed with females for breeding purposes. We kind of move them back and forth. This is an amelanistic, a high orange. It's really a pretty new male that we got at one of the Tinley shows. We're raising him up to replace Chuck since he will make prettier babies than Chuck does. Your babies are adorable, Chuck, but I want more amels. I think it'd be great to breed some amels. So we're raising him up, and just look at the color difference. He will produce some really pretty baby fat-tailed geckos. Now, you can kind of see the difference between a, an original tail on a fat-tailed gecko here and regrown tails on these three over here. When a tail of a fat-tailed or a leopard gecko regrows, it's much more bulbous than it was before, and it's very smooth. But if a, a fat-tailed gecko with a regrown tail is currently in the breeding season, they sometimes lose a little bit of weight during that season, so that's why his tail isn't as wide as this younger, non-breeding male's is. You can also see that a little bit in this female right here. She has kind of a thinner tail than the female here. That's because this one has been laying eggs for us recently, and she is delegating some of her nutrients to those eggs, but she will beef up once she is done with the egg-laying process. This girl bred for us last year, this is Milton, and uh, she has kind of let herself go. She is very, very big. I think she, uh, I mean, I've been feeding her extra because I want her to lay eggs. And I thought she was developing eggs. She bred for us last year, but there's no eggs yet in her lay box. She's just getting bigger and bigger. So I don't quite know if she's planning on producing this year, but we'll find out. Milton here does not have the fat deposits behind her front arms, which is the sign of an obese gecko. So if your leopard gecko at home or fat-tailed gecko has fat deposits here, it means they are very overweight and should be on a diet, and she doesn't have those yet, so I'm not too concerned about her very, very fat tail. She just lives up to the name fat-tailed gecko. This one, who is who is breeding for us this year, she's already produced four eggs. Uh, you can kind of see the next round of eggs, since geckos lay two eggs at a time. You can see how they develop down here in the abdomen. You can pretty much estimate exactly when they're going to lay the eggs, both based on when they laid the previous set and what you can see growing on the inside. Fat-tailed geckos are a wonderful starter lizard. The only drawback is that they are kind of hard to find, so they can be a little bit higher of a price point than, say, leopard geckos. But if you can get your hands on a fat-tailed, their docile personalities are just amazing. They are very friendly by nature. Down here in our unheated levels of the rack are our amphibians. We've got toads, and we have Salamanders! Another salamander. Okay, that's everyone. These are all of our amphibians. We have a couple of toads. These are just American toads. There's one. And here's the other. This is Trevor, of course, because I do Harry Potter programs sometimes. And that one is also Trevor, because I bring one or the other. And they switch to give each other breaks. Just kind of the tropical substrate. Again, there's springtails in not only their bin, but all of these bins. Over here is Thomas. This is the tiger salamander that regrew this leg. And we actually made an entire video about it, which you can, it looks like this, here's the thumbnail. You can watch his leg regrowing. Thomas really likes food and he may try to eat the camera. Thomas goes to programs, so he has learned to associate people, especially kids, with food, because kids always feed him at the programs. Yeah, you think you can eat everything. 
Next to Thomas is Houdini. This is the little tiger salamander that was given to us by a fan. He is also adjusting very well. Here. You want to wear? Oh, okay. Yes, he does want to worm. I feed these guys crickets and dubia roaches and a lot of earthworms. They'll eat anything that gets close to their mouth. They really don't care. Tiger salamanders have huge appetites. Here's the last one. This is Windowell. You can, I'm sure you can guess where he was found. <laughs> it's mine. Always. Give it Always. to me. Always. This is the reason why we have the shirt in our merch store of a salamander eating a finger. Thomas, don't crawl up here. Okay, toads. That's right there. They're very movement based. Get it, get it. Ah, oh, you both missed. Oh, oh he got his. Got his. Ah. Oh. He ate the piece of dirt that was on top of the roach instead of the roach. Okay, well, we're pretty much done with that rack, so we're gonna move on to this rack right here. This is full of 60 quart tubs. And let's go from the bottom up. Down here, we have Tutti Fruity. She also goes by Nemo. She is a Mexican milk snake. A very friendly milk snake, too. She is a teenager. She's about 14, 15 years old, somewhere around there. But they live to 20, 25, sometimes even 30 if they're really long lived individuals. So she has plenty of time with us still. She is so friendly. She is a little overweight. She was another Craigslist find, and she w she had cleavage when I when I got her. So I've been trying. You can see this cleavage back here. She is definitely an overconditioned or fat snake. So I only feed her an adult, like a jumbo mouse, once every two weeks, and I'm hoping that she starts losing some weight. I've had her for a couple of years. And she doesn't seem to be losing weight much, so I'm trying to get her to be more active too, and that's why I started incorporating her into programs. And that's also because she's so friendly. She's great to have in programs. In case you didn't already know, milk snakes get their name because when farmers first discovered them, they were found in their barns and next to their cows. And the farmers figured, oh no, that snake must be stealing my cow's milk and crawling up its legs and suckling at it while I'm asleep. That's why it's in the barn. So let's call it the milk snake. But we're going to kill it on sight because we don't like snakes that steal from us. Let's call it the milk snake and kill it. Yeah, exactly. Um, obviously snakes don't drink milk. That's not why these snakes were in the barn. They were there to eat the mice that were in the barn. Now I think farmers realize, or many farmers realize, that these snakes are just there to help and kind of keep their barns clean, free of pests. Farmers, I believe, do for the most part like having snakes around because they realize that they're a helpful species. This bin has a red tag on it. That means there's something angry inside, or just sassy. And I see him right there. These are our legless lizards. Cameraman's gonna have to be careful when I open this up. That one's a jerk. The other one's actually really friendly. So let's see how this goes. Hi. I think he just has a really strong feeding response. I, I like to think that he's not actually aggressive or mean. He just really likes to eat. Guys, I changed this yesterday. You already pooped in it. I'm gonna have to change that out again. Well, this is a European legless lizard, or a Sheltopusic, they're also called. They were once known as glass lizards, because people used to think that if you touched them, they would shatter like glass, and then when they weren't scared anymore, they could put all their pieces back together. Obviously, that isn't true. I'm gonna take out the female, push you back. I don't wanna deal with you right now. This is what I believe to be the female. Now, you cannot visually sex these guys. Unless they're pooping, you can kind of watch their cloaca and males will expose their um, reproductive organs as they're going to the bathroom. But in order to see that, you have to be at like, you have to be level with the lizard and you have to be lucky enough that substrate isn't in the way so you can actually see them going to the bathroom. So. Chances are slim you'll be able to sex that way, but it can work. It's just not a 100% sure method either. So another technique is by looking at their head shape. And apparently females have kind of a thinner head shape, whereas males have more of a bulky head. But again, that isn't 100% accurate. So the one way to tell for sure is by doing a blood test and actually getting a DNA sample or a DNA test done on a sample. And we have not done that with these two. Breeding of these guys is virtually non-existent in captivity. So they are unfortunately all wild caught, the ones that are in captivity right now. But who knows, maybe that'll change. Maybe we'll have a pair and we'll get to breed them someday and have captive bred specimens instead of everyone needing to get wild caught ones. 
who knows? We'll see. We have a video all about legless lizards that you can find right here. We also proved that the basilisk from Harry Potter is in fact a legless lizard, and if you want to watch that video, that's right here. Today on the menu for the legless lizards, I meant to put that in here earlier, but I guess now's as good a time as ever, we give them high quality grain-free canned dog food, along with various insects that are dusted with either a multivitamin or calcium powder. Today they're getting super worms along with their dog food. And I think that's what this male really wants. By the way, his name is Lieutenant Dan. And yeah, uh, this is... Did I not tell you that? I don't remember you. Really? Talking. You probably did. I <laughs> Maybe. Oh yeah, that's Lieutenant Dan. This is Legolas. Here's your food. I think that's all he wants is his food. Dan, it's in the dish. Go on. Yeah. Really? And drag it around. We give them aspen fibers just like we do our snakes because not only do they retain retain a tunnel shape to allow them to dig and burrow, but if they ingest a little bit of the bedding with their food, the aspen fibers are small enough that they can be digested, if not just at least passed through, and they shouldn't cause impaction issues. I've heard of someone who had their legless lizards on stone or like aquarium gravel and passed away from impaction from eating the gravel. Next one up is Janet. I won't really spend much time on him. You've seen him before. Janet is the bull snake I had out at the beginning, and you can really just see his tail back here. So I won't take him out again. Next up is the first giant Madagascar hog nose of the day. She's usually in this cave. Yep, there she is. Hi, sweetie. You are so pretty. We got a trio of these Madagascar hogs. This is the uh, largest species of hognose snake. We picked them up at the Tinley Park Expo. It was last March, so we've had them for almost a year. This is one of the females, and this big one here is the male. The other female is very calm. She's in Ed's lap, and she's the one that I handle the most. So these two are kind of a challenge to hold on to, and the female musked all over me. So I smell quite lovely right now. But these are big colubrids. These are solid snakes. They are all adults, so we do plan on breeding them this year, but they breed a little bit later in the year than most other colubrids. Although we pair our other colubrids in March, these guys will have to wait to pair in July or so. All right, those two are put back away because they're too much to handle. This one, however, is pretty mellow, pretty handleable compared to the other two, but really cool snakes. We did have insane issues getting them to eat when we first got them. We were told at the uh, Tinley Park show we picked them up at from the uh, sellers or the vendors, not breeders because these were all wild caught. We were told that they were eating fro frozen thawed unscented rodents already and they had been in captivity for over a year. We couldn't get them to eat anything for at least six months for her. She was the first one to start eating and it took about seven and then eight months for the other two to start eating. So they went a long time without food and we were really worried about their health. But we were able to use some tricks and eventually get them to start eating and now they are fantastic eaters. They are garbage disposals. We just had to work with them a bit and now I'm not worried about them at all. In fact, I am looking forward to producing these in the near future. And I think these are kind of an underrated species. It's probably because nobody breeds them yet. There are a few breeders out there, but they are becoming more popular as they're becoming more available captive bred. This is native to Madagascar, being, you know, the giant Madagascar hognose. It's pretty easy to remember. They live pretty much all over the island, but they prefer well-drained soils, so kind of grassland areas. They're not, they, although they might look like a tropical species of snake that may prefer humid environments, they definitely seem to per prefer it to be on the more drier side. These are also a not very shy species. We've heard plenty of stories of people who are camping in their native range and they woke up to find hognose snakes, giant Madagascar hogs, in their campsite trying to find food. We're gonna put her back. We have trays in a lot of their habitats because that's where we place their mouse on to separate it from the bedding below. We have a video all about giant Madagascar hog noses, so if you wanna learn more about them, it's right here. Next up is our fox snake. Her favorite spot is under this log. That's where I find her all the time. This is the only fox snake we have that's not in brumation because I need her in programs throughout the year, but it's essential to brumate this species in order to get them to breed the following spring, so I'm sure she won't want to breed for us this year. She was found in a box at the end of someone's driveway that said free snake on it. So someone picked up the box, looked inside, saw the snake inside, and it had a wound that uh, you could actually see the, the backbone sticking out through the skin and through the scales, and you could touch her back vertebrae. It was just, they were just right there. 
So we got her in the long run, and after a couple of years of sheds, she healed right up, although she has this pretty gnarly scab, or uh, scar. A lot of people mix up fox snakes with bull snakes, so you really kind of have to look at their faces. Fox snakes have a much more rounded face, like a rounded nose right here, whereas bull snakes have quite a pointed nose in comparison. These also have a completely brown head as adults, but babies have some spots to their head, so you can't really go by that. Um, if you know their pattern, it's easy to tell them apart, but if you don't know what the patterns or have them memorized, just look at the nose shape. Here's an example of a bull snake, so you can see how much more pointed the nose is. Now I'm going to pull this whole thing down. She's going to be kind of tough to take out. This is one of our new bull snakes that we picked up last fall when we picked up, I think it was 11 in one group. There's a whole video about it. This is one of the Xanthics, so really pretty. Look at her nose though. See how much more pointed it is? So that's one of the biggest difference between bulls and foxes. So really pretty snake. She's a little too young to breed. That's why we haven't been brumating her this year. Instead, we're spending the time to beef her up a little bit. But as you can see, she was not handled in her previous home, so she's a bit skittish. I know all you want is your cave. So, here, cave. Ta-da! The male is as skittish as she is. The male exanthic is just above her, so I'm not going to take him out. So he looks exactly the same. The habitat is very similar. Instead, we're just going to move on to the next rack. So over here we have our egg-eating snakes. We have them separated by species. This is the Daisy Peltis fasciata. They are cute little egg eaters. Kind of have a smaller female in here. It's a very slender species of snake. Hi cutie. They're really easy to feed. Well, once they're this size, they're easy to feed. You just put fresh quail eggs, you pooped on that one, put fresh quail eggs inside their habitat and as they eat them they crunch up the shell and just leave a shell behind. This was actually a diamond dove egg if I remember correctly that I got from a friend. Like any any bird egg will work. They'll eat them all. They do seem to prefer bird eggs from species that nest up in trees as opposed to ground dwelling species. That's because these shells are thicker so it's a little harder for them to eat. But they'll still eat them, it's fine. I'm going to put you back in here. There's actually two in there. They have no teeth, so they can't eat each other. They get along fine. As long as they eat, you can cohab them. There, this is the Daisy Peltis Ganzi, or Ganzi. Oh, there they are. We have a male and female together in here. This is a slightly darker species. They have darker eyes, too. And the female, if I take out the male, she might show you their defense mechanism, which is really cool. Let's see if she'll do it. There it is. So when this snake feels threatened, they rub their keeled scales together to make that raspy sound. And this... <laughs> She's very good at displaying it. It's kind of cool, too. And the reason why they do that is because in their native range in Africa, the saw-skilled viper does the same thing. And it rubs its scales together to look intimidating and scary. Hopefully you can still hear everything when they're going at it. So they just try to act like they're a soft-scaled viper and uh, to scare you away, but they don't even have teeth. Sometimes they'll bluff strike, but not often. It's usually just... Oh, there's a bluff strike. But uh, usually they just rub those scales together. Are you done? All right. All right. Wow! That was mouth open too, that was pretty cool. You know, dude. You made her mad, now you're putting him back in I know. there with her. I'm gonna put him in the other cave. I'm sorry, your girlfriend is in a mood right now. It's like the worst thing you can do. Yeah, nope. Okay, calm down, calm down. Male. Oh, he's doing it too now. Yeah, well, now they're both Really? Yeah, now they're both angry. I'm sorry. He's like, I'm mad, you made her mad. Now <laughs> I have to deal with her. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just gonna push this back in and let them calm down. Below here we have the tricolor male you saw earlier, and now we have some western hog noses. We have a lot of our western hogs in this rack. In this one we have, this is a female that's actually going to be upgrading her bin soon. She is a little bit hissy, that's okay. She is apparently a pastel morph, but honestly she looks like a normal to me. But she is just about breeding size, so we might be breeding her, probably will be breeding her this year. 
And here's our her future boyfriend, who is also supposedly a pastel. Again, he looks normal, but that's okay. They'll still have cute babies, I'm sure. There's a little bit of a color difference between the two, and they're really nice little snakes. Ready for more hog noses? This is probably my favorite hog nose that I have. This is a twin spot albino, or albino twin spot, whatever you want to call it. The albino is, of course, her color mutation, and the twin spot is the pattern mutation she has. You see, instead of one large central spot down her back, she has two that are side by side. This is not a trait that you can breed for. It's a line bred trait. If you want to learn what line bred traits are, we have a whole video about genetics you can watch, but I'm not going to go into details about it here. Then we also have on the other side, this is a condomorph. So they have the black belly, which is really nice. They have the white walls along the side of their black belly. And dorsally, they have fewer spots. So they have a reduced pattern on their back. And this is a uh, co-dominant trait. So we will, when she's big enough, hopefully be breeding her. But she is, neither of these are big enough to breed yet. So maybe next year. We'll see. She was a terrible eater when we first got her. So she's a little bit on the smaller side for her age. Didn't she had something? Oh yeah, she's had albino. Oh, that's yep. Right. Yep. So by breeding her, we might get some albino condos, which would be cool. All right, we'll put you back. Here you. Oh. What? Really? Nice. Now she's a great eater, as you can see. Oh, I didn't get that in focus very well. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, she's never done that before. Well, she's That's hungry. Cool. No yeah. Feed me. Maybe I smelled like food. Next to them is Bacon. She's another conda mutation. So she's also she also has that beautiful reduced pattern down her back, along with the black belly that you can see here. Really pretty snake, and she's super calm. This girl joins me at a lot of programs, so she's used to being handled almost on a daily basis. And she eats in front of crowds too, which is like unheard of for hognose snakes. They can be picky eaters, so to have one eat in front of someone, like in front of a group, is, well, we lucked out with her, is what I'll say there. Are you a chill snake? All right, I'll put you back. There you go. And these two bins are just more hog noses. We have a normal that's het albino and exanthic, so she's het snow, but she visually looks normal. This is Lumpy. He's just a normal, uh, no heads or anything, just a normal western hognose snake. Beautiful snake. We're, uh, we use him in programs when she needs to take a break. So we kind of flip-flop between these two so they don't get overwhelmed with programs. But a fan actually sent us Lumpy. And uh, if you're watching this, he's doing great. He's an awesome, awesome little hognose snake. Beneath those two are yet more hognoses. These are more western hognoses. This is kind of a kind of looks red. She wasn't she wasn't sold to me as a red, but she's a really pretty kind of copper color. This is a pair of hedexanthic hognoses. This is the female, this is the male. He's not a very good eater, so he's a little bit on the smaller side, but the female is nice and beefy, but she's still not quite big enough to breed. So we're thinking maybe next year, so 2020, we'll be able to breed them and then hopefully produce exanthics. Then over here, I won't take them out. As you can see, it's a red tag, so I have to be kind of careful. This is a male rat snake, and just like all rat snakes, he has a huge appetite. And he also is very um, active, so we have lots of things for him to explore and uh, climb on and underneath. He also has his humidity box over there, but I'm not going to take him out because he's so food motivated. I'd rather not get bit by another snake today. Down here is candy corn. This is an albino Nelson's milk snake. We got him at another Tinley show. You probably saw the, maybe you saw the video where we picked him up. He was pretty wild when we first got him, but he's definitely calming down with some regular handling. And I hope to incorporate him into programs sometime soon. We had another albino Nelson's milk snake named Candy Cane, and she, I mean, I assume we still have her, but I brought her home from a program once and put her in the bin and closed it, but there was a little gap that was still open. And of course she found that gap overnight. And by the time I saw that gap the next morning, she was out. So Candy Cane is loose right now, which I'm still kicking myself over for not closing the bin all the way. So that's why you always double check. Learn from my mistake, guys. Double check your enclosures, make sure they're closed securely and all the way each time you put your snake back. Because if it's not, they will find that small gap and they'll escape. So I'm sure we'll find her eventually. She's just not here right now. She's out, out fighting crime, we figure. But we have Candy Corn instead for the time being. And he is a wonderful addition. We'd like to breed him to Candy Cane someday when she shows up. And then on this side, we have 
our newest false water cobra. Hi, sweetie. Oh my goodness, I know, I know. We're still working on handling. She's not too bad, she does calm down with time, but she's still trying to figure out what people are. She's growing quick. We love false water cobras. We'll show you a couple other in part two of this reptile house tour. And this is the girl we are raising up. We bought her as a baby from a breeder and we hope to breed her someday. But in the meantime, we're just having fun watching her grow and eat and eat and eat. These are garbage disposals. They're like never ending pits. She would eat every single day if we offered it. But I of course don't want to feed her too much or she'll get fat and uh, it could actually cut her lifespan in half if not more if we were to power feed her. So we're just still feeding her at a normal rate. She's another one of the snakes that has kind of a tropical setup in her enclosure. They like humid environments in the wild. So we have her on uh, Eco Earth and Cypress Mulch mixed together, just like that tricolor that's up a ways. And just like the tricolor, we have lots of springtails in here to break down the waste matter. And we're hoping to add some isopods in there too. Um, the last snake I want to show you, or the last species that's in this wreck, would be the bull snakes that we held back from last year. Inside of this bin is the albino that we held back and she is beautiful. This was the high white albino that we hatched out last year. This is the hypo snow. So he's hypo and albino and white sided all put together. This is a male and this is a female. This is a just a regular snow. So she is the same thing but without hypo. Both pretty much white snakes. One just has a little bit more of a pattern than the other. And then if you compare them to the albino here, you get another cool shade of like orange and pink mixed in. And there's actually one more even that we held back. This one, which I just pulled from another enclosure, is a hybino, so hypo and albino. So look at all those different colors and patterns. These are gonna be so much fun to breed in the future. But again, just like the false water cobra, we're just enjoying watching them grow in the meantime. All right, there's one more rack in this room. That'll probably be uh, well, two. two, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's like two more racks in this room and that'll be the end of part one for this video because I know there's a lot to see in this room. Uh, this is giant Madagascar hog. You already saw her. And down below, this is creepy cooter. He is a corn snake, a blood red mutation corn snake. He was abandoned in an apartment complex and really thin when we first got him. We have a video about when we got him in case you want to watch it. And he's actually named after a character from another YouTube channel that we watch, but he's super friendly. And this guy goes to programs with me too. And he eats in front of crowds. And we're not going to breed him though, because the blood red mutation of corn snakes has the weakest immune system out of all of the genetic mutations. We are not going to breed him because we don't want to produce snakes with weak immune systems. So we just have him as a rescue and as our pet. But I'm going to sit you back down and it's going to go right back into his cave. Yep. Going into his cave. He really likes this log. He's usually wound up underneath it. It's funny. Some snakes really like half logs. Okay, down below is one of Ed's reticulated pythons. A pretty young one. This guy was a rescue as well. He was pretty thin when we, when we got him. But he's actually looking a lot better now. He is an albino golden child mutation. So a really pretty reticulated python. No super dwarf or anything in him. So he's a mainland retic and he will get big someday. He is thankfully a great eater nowadays. It's just too bad that he wasn't at first and he came from kind of a poor situation originally, but he's a, he's a great little snake. He usually has an attitude, which is why he has a red tag, <laughs> but actually he was really docile today. Down here are Ed's. This is like Ed's section. These are the Woma pythons and you are under your water dish looking adorable. That's, that's a great thing about these water dishes is they're kind of hollow underneath. So they double as a hide. You have like made yourself in the exact same shape of it too. This is the male Woma Python. He is not super handleable. I mean, he's okay. He's just kind of wiggly. He, these grow to around five to six feet. So he has some room to grow yet. How old is he? Two years? Two, two and a half. Three. Okay. Yeah, we're hoping to breed him someday, but we have to wait till he's big enough first. But I'll put him back and instead I'll take out the female who's a little bit bigger. Hi, sweetie. This one goes to programs with me. These are native to Australia, by the way. They live in such a hot area in Australia that they only touch a few inches of their belly to the hot sand at a time. And this girl has a big appetite. A lot of people will tell you that Woma pythons have very strong feeding responses, which we have, we've, we would agree with. 
but people will also tell you that they are an aggressive species of snake. But we think they just have big appetites. It's not that they're mean, they just really like food. So as long as you handle them regularly, they make fantastic pet snakes. One thing I really like about the Woma Python is their orange belly. Look at that! Isn't that cool? I don't know any other snake that has this color of an orange belly. It's just super cool. Ringneck snakes, I mean, kind of have an orange belly, but they're so tiny you can barely see it. Okay, that fin- oh, nope, that's right, there's one more. I'm sorry. This is kind of a newer snake. You know us and bull snakes. This is a hypo mutation bull snake. Oh, you just pooped too. Look at that. That's a fresh poop. Looks good though. This guy was really skinny when we got him last fall, so we decided, even though he's breeding size, we didn't want to brewmate him because we wanted to take that time to help um, beef him up a little bit and get the weight back on him, and he's looking excellent nowadays. He's gotten the weight back on no problem. It helps that he's a bull snake and they love to eat. But I think this is a true hypomelanistic bull snake. Hypo means they lack melanin or they lack black coloration in their scales. And if you look at him, there's no black anywhere. A lot of hypo bull snakes, you'll still see some black on their tail, but that's all brown. So this may be the first true hypo bull snake we have ever seen. So of course we had to buy him. Last rack. This is the baby rack. Up here, we have a fox snake baby. Oh, you're in shed. Look at that. You're just about to shed too. Got a nice tail buzz going already. Oh, you're so, so scary. So scary. Come on, you're fox snake. You guys are supposed to be really friendly. We're just raising up this little girl and this little girl to be future breeders. And these are actually about ready for uh, bin upgrade. They are growing pretty quickly. These, we have a bunch of empty bins. Uh, we store our, our, we house our baby snakes that we hatched in the summer in this rack. So it's winter. A lot of those babies have sold. We have a few still, but not many. Like this is a bull snake from a friend of ours who bred her and we're, um, she's getting a new home pretty soon. She's just in here temporarily. And then same thing for a couple other bull snakes in here. They're not ones that we're keeping. They're just for sale or already sold. We have a couple of hog noses. This was... Head snow hog up here? Yeah, this is the male head snow. Oh, He's okay. a really bad eater in that other bigger rack. Uh -huh. So a trick to getting hog nose snakes to eat is to put them in slightly smaller enclosures and that usually helps. I just moved him last week, so I don't know if he's gonna eat yet, but I'm hoping that it helps. Oh, here's the... Um, scaleless rat corn that we bred last year. Oh, you shed. Nice. Hey, buddy. You're looking good. He ate yesterday. <laughs> He's so wrinkly. We're just raising him up as well, just to kind of see. Oh, that's right. I wonder if you can see his heart beating. The main reason why I kept this as a holdback was because you can see his heart beating through his body. You can see him digesting his meals. You can see when he's about to poop. So you're my little science experiment hold back. And that's really the main reason why I'm keeping him. Oh, uh, here's and another. He's yeah, and he's really pretty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's gorgeous. Here is the Superconda. Man, you dumped your water again. This is a Superconda hognose that we hatched a while ago and held back. He's also kind of small because he was a horrible eater. He still only eats live mice. I cannot, for the life of me, get him on frozen thawed. But I've kind of given up and I'm just feeding him now live because I want to bump up his size so that I can, I don't know, watch him grow and see him as an adult. Last would be, I mean, other than a couple other bull snakes that aren't, aren't ours, we have garter snakes down here. We are raising up some garter snakes. These are the probably, oh, they're going to be spazzes, of course. We have California red-sided garters in here. Beautiful. And they're gone. Here they are. Garters we found do better when they're kept in groups. They eat better. They are kind of calmer. California red-sided, though, are kind of crazy snakes. They're very active. However, check out this little girl. This is one of the hybrids we had last year. She's growing really well and she is so pretty. She has some ribbon snake in her and some plains garter snake in her. She has checkered garter snake from her dad. She was an oops litter. We did not mean to breed her parents together, but after seeing how pretty she's turning out, I am actually kind of okay with it. She's a really nice snake. And she's actually a lot calmer too than those California red-sideds. She's also a great eater too. These guys are eating fish and worms 
and Jeez. pinkies. Yeah, we're feeding pinkies now. And that's that. Oh, that was, oh, really? You could poop on your stand. That whole time we were filming, you had to poop right now. That was a lot. That was a lot of snakes, a lot of reptiles. We, it probably took two hours, I think it was, to film all of that. So we are going to call it a day, but this will be the end of part one to our reptile house tour. Our next two videos will be showing you the rest of the animals that live in our house. Of course, I don't want to skip over Cheyenne though. Cheyenne is our rescue blue and gold macaw, and she is plucked because she was neglected in a previous home, and she picked up this habit of plucking her feathers out due to stress and boredom. So this is a habit like chewing on your fingernails where it's hard to stop or curb this behavior. Macaws have a mental age of about a three-year-old. They're like toddlers for life. Life. So it's like getting a toddler to stop biting their nails, which is difficult and it's difficult to get you to stop this habit But that's okay. We love her anyway. Her personality more than makes up for it and she is our baby So she also lives in this room, which is why I wanted to include her in this video I'll Just put her She just her. makes a lot of noise. She's not too bad. Well, she mumbles in the she doesn't scream like a lot of macaws yeah, well, do not like macaw, but she's Yeah, click 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 she mumbles jingle, 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 and mumble, yeah, mumble. knocks things over while we're trying to film. So she was in the other room until just now. We just brought her back. You're a good girl, though. So again, thank you everyone for all of your support over these last couple of years. We wouldn't be where we are now without all of your encouragement and all of your support. So thank you again. Uh, the next few videos will also be celebrating a million subscribers and they will again have a blue border around the thumbnail so they'll be easy to find. We would also like to thank all of our Patreon supporters for backing this channel. But with that all said, stay tuned for part two. And then let's test out Cheyenne's knowledge before we leave. Okay, Cheyenne. The nut is in this hand. Ready? Which one? Oh, you got it! Good girl! Wow, she actually picked the right one. Mmm. Is that good? We'll see you later. Ugh, really. Ugh. <laughs> Don't put your tail in my mouth. What is wrong with you? That whole time we were filming, you had to poop right now. The joys of having a bird. Right, Cheyenne? Say, I poop where I please. And then I make mom clean it up. Oh, this is a bad one, too. Not what we needed right now, Cheyenne. Yeah. And you said you wanted to film the second part today.